Don't forget to turn your phone off, Tony. Yep. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to JMT's Expert Speaker Series. We're going to wait just a few more seconds to let people get logged in, and uh, we will be right back with you, so please hang on. Looks like we have quite a few people joining us today, so we're excited to have you all. I'll give it just a few more seconds and then we'll get started. All right, thank you again for joining JMT Consulting for our expert speaker series. My name is Melissa and I'm the manager of events and programs here at JMT and we're happy to have Tony Polari of Excellus Consulting and Jane Brody of Vicus Partners talking today about the five principles of effective strategic planning. This webinar is sponsored by JMT Consulting and we're an ERP and financial management solutions firm with 30 years experience and specialized in nonprofit. I wanna share a few housekeeping notes and then I'm gonna turn it over to Tony and Jane. If you have any questions at all during the webinar, please make sure that you submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your control panel, and we will get to those questions at the end of the webinar. You are also going to receive a copy of the recording today, as well as the slides. Those will be emailed to you uh, by the end of the day, if not tomorrow morning. Finally, I'd like to introduce Tony and Jane. Tony is the co-founder of Excellus Consulting, he is a healthcare executive with more than 20 years in academic medicine, consulting, and biomedical research with a focus on strategic and operational planning and implementation. He is an experienced leader who drives discussion and collaboration and an accomplished business planner with demonstrated success launching new initiatives. Jane Brody is an experienced and passionate New York City commercial real estate broker who proudly represents tenants in the nonprofit education and medical industries. Because Vicus Partners only represents tenants and never landlords, Jane represents your best interests without a hidden conflict of interest and remains your unwavering advocate throughout the process. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Tony and Jane, and thank you for being here. Great. Well, thank you for having us. We're both very excited to be here to talk about the five principles of effective strategic planning. So what we're going to cover today, we'll talk about designing the strategic planning process, uh, we'll discuss developing an integrated real estate strategy as part of that process and also how to manage and use the related real estate assets. We'll talk about the three parts of an effective strategic plan. And we'll talk about perhaps the most important piece, executing on your strategy. We'll do a quick recap and then we want to make sure we leave plenty of time for questions and answers. So to begin um, on designing the process, I think one of the key takeaways from this talk is that the strategic planning process needs to involve and be owned by everybody in your organization. Everyone needs to have a stake in the development of a plan because everyone has a very real stake in the success of that plan. So the planning process should be built around your executive team. These are the senior leaders that will move the process forward and that will ultimately be accountable for execution of the strategy. Um, you should involve your employees, certainly. For larger organizations, that may be harder to do but certainly the idea of employee representatives from different functional groups, for example, is one way to get employees involved in the process. You want to involve your board of directors, external advisors, and major donors. Those groups will certainly overlap, um, but these are very important stakeholders that you need to involve in the process. And then finally, to the extent you can, you should involve the people that you serve. Um, and the idea behind all this, again, is that everyone should have ownership of the plan this also creates that sense of buy-in in the plan. You're much more likely to support something that you played a role in developing. Uh, in terms of the structure for this process, it's very helpful and important to have something akin to a project management office. And this is the role that Excellus Consulting and Vicus Partners often fulfills for our clients. You're gonna be gathering a lot of information. You'll be doing a lot of research. And it's always helpful to have someone moving that process forward, helping you make sense out of all that information that you gather, and then really helping frame your thought process. Really, what do you do with all this information once you have it? Uh, it's also very helpful to create working groups or subcommittees, whatever you might want to call them, to tackle different parts of your plan. 
output. Again, this is a lot of work. So these groups, these working groups can be designed functionally. You can have a finance working group, for example, IT working group, perhaps. These groups can be structured more operationally. So you might have something like fundraising that cuts across multiple functional units. Or you can think about it in terms of, of the pillars or the initiatives that you might develop for your strategic plan. Uh, my personal preference is um, more towards the, the strategic pillar model, more towards that cross-functional uh, approach, because I think the benefit there is you bring together a lot of different people with different skills and experience and different perspective, and you can get a lot of really productive conversation and planning and thought going that way. So in addition to uh, designing the process, you have a number of tools at your disposal to help you gather the information that will help you formulate your plan. One-on-one uh, -on -one and group interviews are a great way to involve um, employees and other stakeholders. Focus groups and surveys let you bring in perspectives perhaps from outside of the organization. Uh, one word about surveys, they are a little more impersonal. You will gather a lot of information, so you also need to be prepared to analyze and make sense out of that information, particularly if you're using open-ended qualitative questions. Right? The, is there anything else you'd like to share question is one of my favorite questions. Um, but it does involve a good deal of work to really get value from the answers that you receive. Right? And you should look externally as well. You should do an environmental scan, get a sense of what's happening in your industry and beyond your industry. Look at your competitors. What are they doing? Uh, benchmarking analysis is also really helpful. It lets you look at what you might call your aspirational peers. When you think about who do you want to be like, when you think about those organizations that are doing things really, really well that you'd like to emulate. One of my favorite uh, sayings is share, uh, steal shamelessly, share seamlessly. The idea being, look at your peers, look at your aspirational peers, emulate what they do. And then in turn, your organization will become the organization you want it to be and will become a benchmark for others. And last but not least, review your previous plans if you have them. Right? Certainly uh, an important step in figuring out where to go next is understanding where you've already been. Highlight one specific tool that I'm sure a lot of people on the webinar are familiar with is the SWOT analysis. And SWOT stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. This is often a good starting point for strategic planning process because it lets you take a big picture view. Um, the slide sort of details the nature of each of those boxes and how they relate to each other. These aren't hard and fast rules. Um, you can really take this in any direction that you like, which is one of the benefits of the SWOT analysis. But this is at least how, how we tend to think about it. And I think how you can probably get the most value from it. Um, one of the things that you're certainly gonna want to think about is your real estate, estate strategy. So I'll turn it over to Jane to talk about how we think about that important component of your plan. Hi everyone, so great to be with you today. Thank you, Tony. I think the most important thing is really thinking about what do you need to accomplish in your space? What has to happen? Are you serving clients? Are you running training programs? Really the functionality. So if you look at, for instance, going on to the left, are you holding board meetings? Do you need classroom space? Are you holding events? And what is the access for the space for your clients, your staff and your proximity to transportation are really important considerations. Do you need parking? Is it a place where you know staff can run out and grab lunch? So those are sort of things to think about in the functionality of the space. And then something that people don't often think about is the perception of the space. For instance, I have an adoption agency that I work with and they wanted to make sure that they had a side street kind of shorter building because they didn't want the intimidation of having the birth mothers go into buildings where there was a lot of security questions or it could be intimidating. So really understanding what the environment that you're presenting. And of course, you don't wanna be in a class A building perhaps because donors might be thinking you're spending all your money on rent so those are some things to think about. Are you hosting donors and board members? So it has to be kind of nice enough. And then, and of course, the employee buy-in, which 
Tony mentioned already, the stakeholder aspect is really important so that they hear their voice and they're gonna be recognized. Then the next aspect is looking at the fiscal issues. What are your funding streams? Do you have state and city grants that are consistent? Are you building a program based on certain fiscal funding streams that might be cut? So how do you project what space you need based on the funding streams? Certainly kind of everything drives to mission and funds. So you wanna make sure you're planning that you're not gonna go out of business if you lose one particular grant and that you're hedging your real estate decisions based on a variety of funding streams. And that's where the public versus private funding needs to come into play. Then there's a the question of space optimization. I think, let me just mention a little bit about COVID because this is an important time to think about how much space do I really need? So I'm gonna take a pause here and talk about COVID. People have said to me, oh, wow, you know, we need more space because of social distancing. That is true and that people are working remotely, maybe I need less space long-term. So those are some key considerations in planning your space. And certainly, you know, we work with a whole range of experts that help you figure out workflow, how to, all the considerations you need to have to be COVID ready. But there's certain things that are important in thinking about the kind of organization that you are. For instance, are you client facing? Do you need to have a central headquarters? And then do you need to have offices in other catchment areas to serve your clients? Those are also budget and real estate considerations. Having everything centralized often can be very expensive, but really good for operating your program. So it depends on the kind of organization. Think of them as sort of three types front runner kind of organizations that are doing frontline work, organizations that are training, technical assistance, helping other nonprofits. That's like another group of organizations. And of course, we have all the arts organizations that are probably going to be the most hit during COVID. So one of the things that's very prevalent right now in real estate is sublets. So if you need a little more space for a year and a half, two years, there are plenty of opportunities to get below market spaces. If you need to pop into something that's, you know, hopefully friendly on the bottom line. So that's an opportunity for you. And I also want to mention that as far as the market, there is probably a higher percentage, 12% of the market is sublets. In 2008, it was as high as 24%. So we're seeing a greater flow of sublets. Landlords are not necessarily coming down in sort of B buildings, which are those without doorman and high security, but because there's less space in those areas. And then in outer borough locations, there's finite amount of space. But the reductions we're seeing are in the class A buildings, which are the, the types of buildings that are the signature buildings, the, the main stray Grand Central Station areas. We've seen reductions of about 10 to 20%. The other consideration is if you want an open floor plan or closed offices. This is sort of the big debate of under space optimization. People are torn between open floor plans and closed offices. I think eventually we'll settle on probably a hybrid approach. It can be noisy. It works really well if you've got a lot of teams that like to work collaboratively and open. But if you're doing quiet counseling or nonprofit services that need confidentiality, you will need closed offices. But I think a mixture is good. And also for every desk that's, we call it bench seating in a row, you'll need to have an alternative space. So you have to have some nice lunch space or creative space or conference room space. People can't necessarily sit at a tiny screen all day long without having an opportunity to have some other places to go work. And it also depends on the, the kinds of employees that you have and what is efficient and effective for your organization. I know that was a ton of information, but I'm gonna go over a little more and we'll have a chance for questions. So let me just take you to the next slide, which is developing the real estate strategy process. Very similar to any sort of 
change an organization, you want to make sure that you have all of your stakeholders involved. So for instance, in terms of what happens in the space, which we talked about prior, is important. I had a food pantry program a couple years back, and they needed food delivered to their space. So it was really important that the space had a loading dock, tractor trailer could turn and drop off food. So sometimes the considerations of space are kind of external things that you need to think about. You need to do your due diligence, looking at properties that are both on and off market. You want to make sure that if you need sign off from some of your funders, I was working with a needle exchange program, they had to have a Department of Health sign off that they're involved in the process. Then we do what we call letters of intent, LOIs, and we submit them to multiple opportunities. This is also a lease or a sale. And then we provide some comparative analysis. We love it if we can get different landlords to compete against you, because we always feel that your mission and your work is critical. And landlords are made up of 75% are in spaces less than 10,000 feet. So they really need these kinds of tenants and nonprofits make up the second largest supplier of space. So these are important things in this world. And I think in terms of COVID, nonprofits will continue and the work will be going on. So landlords are looking to make transactions happen. Then of course, you'll be needing to have a lawyer because nothing is really simple. There'll be very extensive lease and lease negotiations that happen between lawyers. Then you have to have your design and your construction. We always try to get the landlord to build out as much as possible because we know that you're all working very hard to do your nonprofit mission and your work and you don't need another job. So we encourage you to have a project manager and also work through, if possible, a landlord doing a turnkey build or build out for you. And then of course, having an ongoing central point of contact. Okay, let me talk about the variations of the things that real estate can offer you. You can have an outright ownership. Now this is great because then you've gotten equity in a building. A lot of charter schools in New York are working towards this. Sometimes they work through a ground up and buy land and use bonds and all different types of funding strategies to help you make that purchase. It can take 18, 20 years until it makes sense that you've invested in this way, but you know that your school always has a place to be. There are hidden things in, in ownership, just like all of you who own homes. Boilers can go, you can have capital campaigns that you have to happen because you have to have a new roof or other systems. So you have to have contingency plans for that. There's also the direct long-term lease which is probably 95% of the transactions. What's nice about that opportunity, it's somebody else's headache, the capital expenses, and you have a set amount and you can plan for what your costs are gonna be because you have a fixed rent with some escalations built in and you can work on a rent schedule. Sometimes in cases of schools, if you're expanding, there can be a ramp up period. The landlord is willing to work with you during that period of time. Another strategy is lease to own. That's when you could start out with a leasing and then eventually have an option to then purchase. The last one is joint venture. My favorite example of this one is the girls club down the Lower East Side. They actually worked, they had a couple of milk carton cartons and they were going from place to place serving young girls in the Lower East Side and they came, they came upon some land that they wanted to purchase, which they did. They had a capital fundraising and then they got an affordable housing partner and they were able to build a building on top of the girls club. So they were able to kind of share the financial burden and they went into a joint venture opportunity. So I'm going to uh, turn it, let's I think, then we go on to Tony, you're the next slide. So, so far we've talked about designing the process for developing your strategic plan, uh, the toolkit that you would use to do that, the importance of developing uh, an integrated real estate strategy and thinking about how to use those assets. So now you're ready to construct the plan itself, right? And we think an effective strategic plan has three components. It covers your strategic position, 
right? That's the space that you'll occupy in the market. Uh, it includes a financial model. This details all the resources that you'll need to deploy to execute on your plan. And then it also includes your implementation plan. Uh, and as we'll talk about later, this is more than just your task list. This is something that you can use to create a sense of accountability and ownership of the plan. Uh, so we'll start with the strategic position. If the first key takeaway is that you should involve the entire organization in the planning process, the next one is, as I like to say, you can't build Fords and Ferraris. Um, so what do I mean? Your strategic position articulates the space you're gonna occupy, right? how you'll claim it and how you'll defend it. But the flip side of this, and I stress this with my clients, is that your strategy is often about as much uh, about what you will not do uh, in addition to what you will do. And it's important to understand that and understand that distinction. So why is that? To bother, uh, borrow a cliche, it's hard to be all things to all people, right? You may not be able to gather and deploy all the resources you need. Those resources might be very diverse if you're trying to occupy two different spaces. You may not be able to convince your customers and your stakeholders. They may think of you in a certain way. They may have a very long standing relationship with you um, and not be ready to see you transition into a different space. And finally, you may be constrained by the organization's structure and its history. For example, if you've never done manufacturing, it's hard to pivot from service to manufacturing, though it can be done. Um, and that's another worthwhile point to mention that you, you can do it, it's not impossible. It's just very hard and a lot of things have to go right. So for example, Toyota created its Lexus division, um, but essentially had to create a completely different brand to be able to make that a viable option in the marketplace. And I'd be willing to bet a lot of people, and I had to look this up to double check, don't know that Lexus is essentially a division of, of Toyota. So it's a good example of how perception really um, can, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse, really help you find the path that you should be on. Um, when you start thinking about the, the components of the strategy, the components of the plan, I think of them in two groups. You have your foundational components, and this is your mission, your vision, and your values, or in other words, what do you do? Why do you do it? And what do you believe? What are your, your core uh, operating principles, your core beliefs? Um, operational side are things like your goals. So given your mission, vision, and values, what do you hope to accomplish? Uh, your initiatives, how are you going to accomplish those goals? And finally, at the most granular level, the tasks, what are the specific activities you'll undertake to move forward your initiatives? Now, the language on the right side can vary a bit. These are just the terms that I like to use because I think they're fairly precise. But again, it's just that idea of what do you hope to do? How will you do it? What specifically do you need to accomplish to get there? Now, in terms of how you create those different components, those different uh, sides of the strategic plan, when it comes to the mission, vision, and values, those foundational pieces, these can be a little bit more top-down. They're often developed by the team that leads the organization. But in keeping with that idea of involving everyone, these need to be shared with and validated by the entire organization. On the operational side, those goals and initiatives, these can be a bit more bottom up. There's a lot of real value in having these things be developed by the employees who will do the work, right? Who can really provide that unique perspective on things. But by the same token, these need to be shared with and approved by the executive team. So it really is a partnership involved in getting this right. The second part of an effective strategic plan is your financial model. And in turn, a good financial model has three, uh, three features to it. Um, it's driven by clear assumptions. Right? It makes sense. There's a logic to it that you can explain and that's fairly visible. Um, the timeline is important. Typically, they'll cover five years, um, rarely more, sometimes less. And finally, to the extent that you can, introducing some element of scenario analysis is worthwhile to at least give you a sense of what are the, the, the high, medium, and low um, options or, or alternatives or possibilities out there, just to give you a little bit of framing for your, your financial model. So some modeling best practices. Um, first is make your model's parameters and limitations clear. So what does that mean? Um, it's important to clearly state things like, does your model follow, follow a calendar year or a fiscal year or for some organizations an academic year? That makes a big difference in terms of cash flow for example. Um, are you including inflation? That number adds up fairly quickly over a five-year plan. It's probably more important to make your limitations clear. 
right? Remember, you're making estimates. You're not making predictions. This is your, your best guess at how things will play out. And you need to make sure that people understand that. The underlying conditions on which your model, model is based will change. And you can't anticipate all those changes, but what you can do, and we'll get to this, is design a model that lets you adapt to those changes and reflect them. Be conservative in your assumptions. So when in doubt, err on the side of overstating expenses slightly, understating revenues, and probably overstating timelines, because things always take a little bit longer than we think they will. Right? Make sure you do periodic reality checks. Step back and question all of the assumptions. And not just you, the model builder, but review these things and discuss these things with the larger organization. Uh, for example, if you're thinking about adding people, is the headcount realistic? Are the starting salaries realistic? Is the timeline for bringing those people on board realistic? Do you have enough space to house all these people? These are important considerations. So those reality checks really can make or break a plan. Um, and then another best practice, and there's several other we'll talk about, but another one is make sure you have an at-a-glance summary. Your CEO, your CFO, your board is going to want to know very simply how much will all of this cost? And it's important that you have a clear, easy to understand answer to those questions. Um, the next best practices are, are maybe a little bit more nuts and bolts, but I think very important. Um, I think another key takeaway is make your model easy to update. So for example, if you are using inflation rate, if you are using a fringe rate, if you're using those kinds of numbers that you'll be referring to constantly, put them on their own page, give them their own home. Right? It makes life a lot easier. Um, the flip side of that is if there are unique numbers like starting salary, um, start dates, things like that, call them out and highlight them in their own cells. It just makes it easier for anyone looking at the model to understand um, what it is you're trying to show. Notes are very important. You won't remember all the assumptions that you made. You won't remember all that went into your thought process. But if you document as much as you can, it makes it very easy to explain later on why you made the decisions that you made. So just a few more modeling best practices. Use a consistent approach. Right? So for example, if you're separating staff and executive worksheet salaries or staff and faculty salaries, make those worksheets look the same. Um, if there are certain inconsistencies that you can't avoid, highlight them. But to the extent possible, make everything look the same and feel the same and work the same. It will save you a lot of effort in the long run. And this last point is really important for scenario building. When you present different scenarios, you want people to look at the numbers and look at the differences between the scenarios. You don't want them wondering how you did the math because you're presenting things in slightly different ways. So next is the implementation plan, the second part of an effective strategic plan. Uh, at a basic level, this plan defines exactly what needs to be done, by when, and by whom. Uh, it also helps set the stage for how you talk about these activities because it frames them in a very specific way. Um, but if there's another key takeaway from this presentation, it's that your implementation plan is not just a to-do list. It certainly serves that purpose, but it's much more important than that. The real value we think in an implementation plan is not just that it organizes your action items, but it creates a sense of accountability and ownership and urgency around your strategy. Right? And it engages all your key stakeholders and represents a real commitment. If you have a public document that says, Tony will complete this task by September 30th, Tony had better complete that task by September 30th. Right? There's a shared sense of accountability. It's also a very useful tool in thinking about change management. So what I mean is, we mentioned earlier, you might be adding new staff to the organization as part of your strategic plan. At a basic level, you're gonna to have to think about the timing for doing that, right? You need to draft job descriptions, post the jobs, schedule interviews, hire people, onboard them, right? But then I think the natural extension of that is then thinking about if we are adding new people, do we need additional space? Do we need a new onboarding process? Do we need to change our salary structure? Do we need to revamp our learning and development structure? These are all things that flow out of taking a very structured approach to documenting all the tasks that you will need to accomplish to get the plan into action. Um, and the last few slides here are talking about executing the plan. And so the whole organization is responsible for designing the plan. The whole organization has ownership and accountability for those tasks we talked about. 
Therefore, the whole organization is accountable and responsible for executing on the plan. And you really need to monitor your progress. So making it one person's job or having a standing strategic planning subcommittee that is constantly looking at that implementation plan, updating it, revising it as needed, is really an important tool in keeping things moving forward. Right? Regular updates about your plan are important. I really do believe that it should be an agenda item on every department meeting, every all hands meeting, uh, every executive team meeting, every, uh, every uh, board meeting, right? Keeping it front and center and visible and making people report on their progress makes it not just another project that you're doing, but really makes the strategic plan the heart of everything else that you're trying to accomplish. Uh, and a final point, a dashboard, which can be as simple as, you know, Gantt charts showing the duration of activities, a red, yellow, green stoplight chart to show whether or not you're on track. There are all sorts of online tools like Smartsheet and Monday that let you organize tasks and create a dashboard. Just having some visual representation of how you're progressing, I think is, is helpful and valuable as well. And then finally, it's important to revisit and refresh the plan. All right, you should look at your strategic plan every year and think about whether the assumptions you made are still valid or whether there have been changes internally or externally that involve making tweaks or adjustments to your plan, particularly that financial model that we talked about. Right? Even if you're staying the course, even if everything is on track and you're growing great, it's important to recognize that. And it gives you a fantastic tool to talk about with your internal organization, your board of directors, your donors, the community at large. That's a powerful message that you can include, for example, in an annual report. Uh, and then finally, refresh your plan periodically. Five years is a long time, right? COVID, I think, has distorted uh, our sense of time, but five years is still a very long time. A lot of things will change and your plan needs to change accordingly. So what I advise clients to do is about the halfway point, so about three years in for a five-year plan, step back and give it a good hard look and figure out whether you need to make any changes. There's nothing wrong with developing a five-year plan and then a second one that overlaps with and in some ways replaces the first one, right? That's how we make progress. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to Jane for just a final recap. So of course, I think the theme is that you should engage everyone in your organization because everyone has a share in thinking about everything from your strategic vision to your implementation plan to the kinds of space that you need. You wanna develop an integrated real estate strategy that kind of considers everything you need to accomplish in your space and everything that you need to do in the future. So this is also kind of intertwined with your strategic vision. You wanna create a strategic vision, a financial model and an implementation plan that links all of these important elements into a successful plan for your organization. The most important thing that I've been thinking about that Tony has said is you don't want this plan to sort of sit in a drawer and you never think about it. It's a living, breathing document and real estate is also something that's part of your ongoing thinking. Space doesn't go away. You can't wait till like three months before you have an issue. It's something you have to think about long term track your progress against your plan regularly, revisit your plan, make sure it's something that is part of your conversation, part of a vision. And it's also for those of you who've looked at the statistics of executive directors, it's kind of an aging group. You want it having it as a legacy for, who, for whoever's gonna step into your shoes. So it's an important planning tool for your organization. And manage real estate's assets wisely. It's an important consideration. It's often the second biggest expense in your budget and make sure that you can manage your expenses. I was an executive director and a board member of an organization that we chose a space that was too expensive. The organization eventually went out of business. So I always think of that as a great lesson in thinking about what's smart for an organization. So it looks like, Tony, we have a couple of questions. Great. So why don't we start with what what would you say is a realistic time frame, start and finish, for the strategic plan to occur? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it it takes quite a while. Right? We're talking about gathering a lot of information, making sense out of it, uh, integrating it into a plan, developing a model and implementation plan, thinking about your real estate strategy, putting that in place. In my experience, I think at the the very outside, probably about six months, can take 
you know, up, up to nine, 12 months. I've seen that happen as well. It depends a bit perhaps on the size of the organization. Um, but certainly I think that six month mark is a very realistic estimate. And Christopher Anderson also asked, what's a good number of high level goals to base the plan on? I'm thinking a range of three to five goals. What's your advice, Tony? Yeah, I, I think that's an ideal, ideal range. Um, more than that, and it just, it just, you drift into that trying to build Fords and Ferraris, right? So if we're thinking about goals or what are the main things you want to accomplish, three to five sounds about right. Each of those three to five goals in turn might have one or two initiatives, right? And that's, that's what goes into your public facing plan. Um, the, the, the average reader of your strategic plan, assuming there is one, is probably not too interested in the nuts and bolts of how will you get things done. But if you have three to five goals, one to two initiatives per goal, I think that's a reasonable body of work to try and accomplish. And I think it makes for a very cohesive plan. And I also want to mention that I think it's important, you know, they always talk about this mission creep, that it really fits into what you are designed and your framers figured out that you should be working on. So how does it tie back to why were you established? Who are you supposed to be serving? What's the vision and the mission of the organization? So I think always watching out for how do you fit within the nonprofit framework and what you're supposed to accomplish. Exactly. We have another question that's, uh, we're thinking about a short-term strategic plan more immediately one year, leading to a longer strategic plan three years. As we see how COVID plays out, does that seem right? We just don't feel like we can make high impact decisions right now, especially as they involve resources we may or may not have. Great question. No, that is a really great question. I, I think that's a perfectly logical approach given how much things have changed and how much they are likely to continue to change long range planning is very, very difficult to do. So taking that shorter term approach, um, figuring out you know, how to get through the next year, as you said, really helps you set the stage for a thoughtful, meaningful, uh, longer term strategic planning effort. So you can think of this as um, revisiting and revitalizing or revising a one year plan and stretching it into something that's a little bit longer. I think that makes perfect sense. I've seen organizations do things along the lines of uh, split the, the visioning part of things, so the mission, vision, value part is one body of work, and then revisiting that and thinking more about the goals and the initiatives to advance it. And that may be somewhat along the lines of, of what you're thinking about. But that said, I think it's perfectly acceptable to develop, you know, a traditional, shall we call it, strategic plan that we've been discussing with a fairly short time frame. Uh, Keith asked a, another great question. What are advantages, disadvantages of having an outside facilitator to guide the process? It's a good question. Um, I think there are uh, a number of advantages. I think in a practical sense, this is a really significant body of work and it can be very difficult for someone in the organization to carve out the time necessary to get it done. And when I say someone in the organization, it's someone who has uh, you know, experience with strategic planning, who's perhaps been with the organization for a while, who really understands how to accomplish a task like this. So that's at a very basic level. I think at a more, um, uh, um, you know, sort of more of an advisory level, your outside person has a vested interest in your success, but doesn't necessarily have a vested interest in a specific outcome, right? So what I'm getting at there is an outside person can sometimes bring a level of ob objectivity that may be missing from within the organization. Right? So that's another, another advantage. Um, and that outside perspective lets that external uh, advisor maybe ask questions that wouldn't occur to the internal group. So that's another value that, that bring to the fore. I think that the disadvantage, to be frank, is that this is a person from outside the organization. They may or may not make the effort to really understand your organization. And they may or may not structure this process so that they're living and breathing it with you um, day to day. The strategic planning initiatives that I've been with and that Jane has been involved with, we really are embed, embed ourselves in the organization because that's really what it takes to do this effectively. I think I would also piggyback on that sometimes because you might have, you know, more dominant roles in the organization, it can be hard to kind of look at everything across the board when you don't have an outside person. Sometimes other things become more emphasized because of an, a particular 
person or program that's highly desirable instead of maybe looking at the big picture. I think there's strengths and weaknesses to having an outside person and an internal person, but they have to have time to focus in on it if you do go internal. Another question is, is there a sample plan or a particular excellent publicly facing plan that you recommend we review to get an idea of the depth and scope? I, I think it depends a bit on your organization. Um, we talked earlier about doing competitor analysis and doing benchmarking analysis. So you might want to look to another organization in your field that's very close to you. Um, you might want to look at your more aspirational peers. I'll have to get back to you on some, some good examples. Um, There's certainly some out there, um, but we can, when we resend the slides out, we can send some links to some plans that are worth looking at. Great, Ron has a really interesting question. Yeah. We have a US NPO that operates in an international markets in a five-year plan, still practical. How do you deal with it in, a, in an un, international business political trend environment? Yeah, no, that's a, a good question. And it gets to that, that uh, issue of volatility that we were talking about earlier with respect to COVID. Um, I think for a case like that, five years may be um, a longer horizon than you want to deal with. Um, we mentioned earlier that shorter plans certainly make sense, and this is probably one of those examples where they do make sense. Um, that said, that process of, you know, treating the plan like a living document, creating a financial model that's flexible and that can account for changes in the marketplace, revisiting the plan regularly um, is another important part of that approach, right? So picking the right time frame, again, for a uh, situation as volatile as this, perhaps three years, but designing things in a way that you're constantly looking at and thinking of the plan, about the plan and revising it as you need to. I, I, Ron, I also sympathize. I mean, of course, change of presidents is gonna play a big part. So I can only imagine you've got like all different things to consider. So good luck with thinking through that. Christopher asked a, another question. Would you recommend a planning retreat or mini retreat for each of the stakeholders, staff, board, et cetera, as you begin the strategic planning process? Mm -hmm. um, I think the answer there is um, um, maybe yes and no. <laughs> I'll explain what I mean. Um, part of it depends on how you're structuring the process as a whole, uh, how you want that process to roll out, um, where you are, you know, as an organization where you are in terms of strategic planning. So it may not be absolutely necessary. On the whole, I think it is a good idea having a kind of formal kickoff like that, that kind of formal brainstorming session um, is valuable. Um, it creates a sense of excitement. Right? We talked about that idea of urgency and accountability and ownership. Excitement is an important component of strategic planning as well, believe it or not. Um, and the only reason I would say no, and I don't mean to pick nits, is the way you framed your question. I don't necessarily know that I would have a retreat for just the staff and just the board. Um, certainly it can be challenging to bring those two groups together, but I think the more cross-pollination you can get across the process, the better off you'll be. So you might do something like some kind of retreat for board, external advisors, major donors, and then a second retreat perhaps for staff, what you might call junior leadership and senior leadership. I might frame it that way. But the short answer to your question is yes, I think something like that can be very valuable for a lot of reasons. I think that's it for the questions. We, we certainly would love to hear if anyone else has anything else on their mind. And of course, I just, both Tony and I feel, and Melissa, that these are incredibly challenging times for nonprofits and we want you to have the greatest success and continue your critical work and we commend you for what you do. So we, we think the world of what you accomplish and we're just really happy to give you some resources and look forward to working with you and being supportive of your work. So thank you for all that you do and how you contribute to the world. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And thank you to we'll Jane. Turn it over to Melissa. Yes. Thank you, Jane and Tony. And if anybody has uh, questions following the webinar, uh, please reach out to us. We'll have a, a way to do that through the follow-up email and we can put you in touch with them. Uh, but I want to thank everyone for attending today and for uh, Tony and Jane's time. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed the presentation.
And if you're interested, Jane is wonderful and will be doing another webinar for us in just a couple weeks. So make sure to sign up for that. Uh, you can find all of our uh, webinars at jmtconsulting.com and you'll see the events tab. So we would love for you to join us. And I think I just saw another chat pop in. Make sure we don't have any questions. Nope, people just saying thank you. So uh, we appreciate it and we'll let everyone have a little bit of their time back. So have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.